Hello and welcome. I see sunshine. That's beautiful. Hi, everyone. Welcome uh, to Dallas Startup Week. This session is uh, Health Startups 301, Life After Series A, when it gets really interesting. And uh, I'm here to thank our sponsors, and this is on behalf of Dallas Startup Week. Chase, Downtown Dallas, Bella Wood, Touch Titans, Dev Mountain, Circles, and Kratos. And special thanks, of course, to 1700 Pacific for this awesome room. Uh, we love being here, and I look forward to this terrific panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fiona. Thank you, Help Wildcatters. My name is Jonathan Clark, and this is uh, uh, Health Startups 301, so that means it's a junior level course, and we've got three PhDs of entrepreneurship right here, representing over a dozen startups and Series A rounds uh, over the course of their careers, and they've got some exciting stories for you here. So I'm going to presume most of the audience is uh, uh, composed of entrepreneurs, and uh, you're probably thinking that life after Series A is a bunch of champagne and caviar. Is it, am I right? <laughs> I think they've got some, uh, some stories to uh, disprove that myth, and uh, we're excited to have them all. My name is Jonathan Clark. I'll be moderating. Uh, from Starting from your left, we've got Paul Hirschman uh, from Thermi, the CEO of Thermi. Uh, Lee Nesbitt is the CEO of Natural Dental Implants. And just to my right here is Tom White, CEO of Find Technologies. Welcome and thank you. I thought we'd just start out by uh, each of them sharing a minute or two of uh, who you are, kind of what your background is, and, uh, and what your company does. Tom, you, okay. Paul, would you like to share? Okay, hi everybody, Paul Hirschman here. So my background um, from an education perspective was pretty shallow, and, uh, but from an entrepreneurial perspective has been, has been pretty bold and pretty successful. I've had probably six startups, um, three that were very successful, one that I took public, and then the, the Thermi's been the most successful venture that we've had to date. It's a, an aesthetic medical device. So we have a device that lifts and tightens all parts of the body and we are based in Dallas we just got purchased by a uh, a international pharmaceutical company from Barcelona Spain for 75 million congratulations uh, I'm Lee Nesbitt I'm the CEO of natural dental implants uh, my background uh, have a degree in history and um, political science and an MBA um, I've been working in startup companies for most of my career. My first job out of graduate school was at the startup company in Berkeley. That company went public. Um, and I kind of caught the startup bug there. You know, I, I always tell people, I think for every year you spend in a, sh a startup year, it should count on your resume like a dog year, like seven years, right? Because you touch so many aspects of business that you don't touch if you're working in a larger organization. Um, so. My company uh, makes uh, teeth replacements. So we make copies of your teeth with a uh, scan. We make a, it's a completely custom device. Not available in the US, it's only available in the European Union. Uh, my prior company uh, that I started with the same co-founder, uh, we made braces that went behind your teeth. We sold that company to 3M in 2007. Um, I've done, I was trying to count, I wanna say it's five Series A, so each one's been different. Hi, uh, Tom White from Fine Technologies, uh, MBA, and then my first startup was out of grad school. It was, a, it was a competitor to Bloomberg, sold that in the late 90s, and then started my first healthcare uh, company, which is a completely different business, uh, enterprise software, sold to hospitals, built that up, and sold it to Nuance Communications, who make Siri, and they make uh, Dragon. Um, and we, and then I started a uh, find in uh, Q1 of 2013, and it's a continuation of the last concept, which is that hospitals have a lot of different moving parts, and they don't communicate very well between doctors and all the licensed professionals uh, in in, the, in, the, in their network. And so it's just a, it's the next evolution using modern technology around uh, um, around communication tools. So uh, that's my background. Great, thank you all so much. I hope one of the things that you're noticing from all of these sessions on entrepreneurship is that nobody has a cut and pasted resume, right? Nobody has the same uh, background from college to MBA to uh, finance to, everybody's got a different story, everybody's got a different background. The one thing that ties all of these people together is really hard work, persistence and dedication. Am I right? Is there something else we're missing? 
That's 90%. <laughs> well, so, so we're talking about Series A, and so we're talking about fundraising. We're talking about raising large amounts of money. This is not the friends and family round. This is not what you're getting from your buddies and bootstrapping together. This is, this is really the first real significant uh, sort of adult money that you're, you're raising. Am I right? Tell me just, tell me a little bit about the sort of uh, the life cycle of a company from inception to Series A. It seems like there's, there's probably as many stories here as there are um, entrepreneur experiences. Some people raise in just a few short months, sometimes it takes years, sometimes people go from seed to very successful uh, without a Series A. What's been your experience just that inception process? You've raised a lot of rounds here between the, the three of you. My, my process is, uh, it's, it's, you know, I, I come up with the ideas, so it's, uh, it's somewhat, somewhat of a lonely process when you start, right? It's, you think it's a great idea, you uh, raise some seed capital, uh, and you hope that uh, you, you find the right customer to help you build the model uh, and build the solution, but it's really you thinking that, hey, this is the right approach to this problem that you're trying to solve. And then uh, the, the Series A is really the, it's, it's where you actually um, have outsiders come in and say, you know, that's a really good idea. We see a lot of growth in that opportunity in the, and, uh, and we want to invest in that area. So uh, series, the Series A for me was, was, a, was a chance for me to kind of get outside my little comfort zone and really and grow uh, intellectually around the business, look at growth opportunities, look at acquisitions, and really kind of think about the future from, uh, from my, and my investors' perspective. I would have to say that I look at it in a couple different tranches. So there's like Series A in the late 90s. Series A in the late 90s is a lot different than Series A today. I mean, back then, there was a lot of money coming your way. You could get huge valuations, lots of money. You could burn through that money at an amazing rate. Um, so I did uh, two startup companies in the 90s, and uh, one of them, I think to date has consumed almost $200 million in venture capital. They're still, I think they're still on the dole. Uh, I'm not gonna mention any names. Um, so coming out of that, the company, the first company I started on my very own, which was Lingual Care with my partner, Rutger, we made braces that went behind your teeth. Um, and so we think, hey, this is a great idea. Every, if you could have braces behind your teeth, wouldn't you rather have that than braces on the front of your teeth? Right? I mean, it seems pretty logical. We're excited. We got this cool technology. You know, we're using it in Germany. Everybody likes it. We come to the US. Nobody wants to hear about it. You know, first of all, venture capital guys are like, uh, dental. Ugh. It's like the ugly, you know, redheaded stepchild of medical. Sorry for using that term, but, you know, no, nobody wants to talk about it. Everybody has a bad association with dental. Oh, dental, right? Who says, oh, I'm going to go to the dentist, right? They can't wait to do it. Um, so there's sort of like this negative perception around dental anyway. Oh, and it's hard because it's just a bunch of mean guys and they're not organized. It's not like a big chain where you can go in and sell an enterprise deal. It's, you know, tackling them one by one. You know, so, so our, you know, we're so excited and suddenly all the feedback we're getting is completely negative. Right? Everybody's telling us nobody wants this and it's a crappy market. Who's ever going to buy that? So we're like, all right. Um, we need to go sell it. So our Series A really came from customers, to be honest. I mean, we went out and sold. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm making sales calls, right? I'm knocking on people's doors. I'm trying to get people to come to a course. You know, I go to trade shows. I don't, can't afford a booth, so I've got like a backpack that's literally a sandwich board. Um, doing everything we can just to get enough people interested. So that's a very different experience than what I had in the 90s. Now, we sold that company. We ultimately did get money and grew the company and sold it to 3M. So now I'm on this startup company. Now I can walk in and say, oh yeah, I sold my last company to 3M. That changes the complete tenor of the conversation. I don't know that this company is any better than the last company. I don't know that I'm any better CEO than I was before. I have more, you know, scuff marks. Um, but somehow that made a much bigger difference and much easier. So. You know, the only thing I can tell you definitively about Series A is no matter how much you raise, it's not enough. So maybe the two um, experiences I'll talk about. The first was in 89, which our Series A was venture capital. We took that company, took it public in 1996, and then sold it to a pharmaceutical company in 2000. 
And really it was from that experience that I determined on this round that I really didn't want to go with venture capital because while there's a lot of great things about it, there also brings um, you know, some issues that you should be concerned with. So like you, on this round, we had a product that was actually we could produce revenues with. So we raised um, most of our capital initially from customers, plastic surgeons and facial plastic physicians that believed in our management team, understood what we were trying to do with the technology, bought the technology, and then they became, as customers, very committed to the development of that and to presenting the science and helping us validate how the technology would work. So we had some of the key opinion leaders in our industry also investors, and it really gave the company a lot of inertia and a special culture was built, which we still enjoy today, as we build, uh, introduce new technologies with our physicians that are, that are customers. Um, I guess really our Series A in this was then, we started the company mid-2012 with $265,000. We purchased an asset from a company in Boston. The device was being used in pain management. And we had a, a software that had been developed to be used in aesthetics. So we purchased uh, that with a, with a friend and began to sell product. And as I mentioned, put the customers together. And then we, in, um, then we I guess in 2014, got about $9 million from Silicon Valley Bank and they coupled with a group here called Cypress Growth Capital, and Cypress provided a, it was kind of a royalty-based a royalty lender, so we put those together. The great thing about that, it was very non-dilutive. The value at that time, we had built up to $32.5 million. Every round we did from positions, we continually focused on driving the price up to make sure that we were increasing value. Your product has to work, you have to deliver results, and because of that, we took smaller tranches, and then we sold the company, um, in February this year to a company in Barcelona for 75 million. But the culture that was developed and the way we went about it, I think it's a real winning thing that you can do. And in this time versus with the venture capital, we were heavily diluted and the culture changed and the pressure uh, upon our management team and a lot of it was good. This time we ended up, my partner and I, who started the company originally in 89, got back together for this and we ended up, he and I and then our CFO with over 80% of the company. So we were able to really, really enjoy the fruits of our labor. And uh, now with the capital that's invested, we're growing worldwide in, into the marketplace. Some really great experience and understanding and wisdom there. I wanna to touch on a couple of those things. One of the things that you said, Tom, was, was that it, it pushed you out of your comfort zone. And I started my own startup just over a year ago. Uh, we raised our, our first Series A-ish size round just to this past October. And I thought, you know, going into this, um, gosh, I'm going to get to, you know, when I close, that's going to be, it's going to be all downhill from here. I've reached the summit. And I realize now that I've hiked into base camp and I'm looking up at Mount Everest going, there's a lot of tricky ice up there. Uh, how would you respond to that? H how much more difficult did your job then become now that you had actual backing? Somebody had validated your idea and your vision and now they're going to hold you accountable to it. I don't, I I don't know if it's if if the added pressure of the, the of the the VC gave it was if, if if that was the challenge. The challenge was that you just you hire more people, you spend more money, you, you grow the business, and you've got to make sure that that the, that the customer demand continues with with the, with the uptake and spend. And so it's it's just the stakes are higher. I mean, you you just you're, you're doing more. You you've, you've got to onboard more people. You've got to maintain the company culture. You've got to report to your board. Um, and then you, and you've got to satisfy the customer at the end goal, at the end, end of the day the customer is the only one that really matters so for us we started with the customer we said well, we're, we're going to keep them happy and uh, in our board and our, our board and our, and our VC has been very very helpful uh, that we their one of their partners is our general counsel and CFO and so they're they're partners really with us and so they've, they've, they've been a good a good strategic entity with us we, we did a, a fairly we did a good round I thought for us from a diluted perspective. But I think it's, your point's great. Um, both, both points are is that, that cap, you can get capital in many different ways. Customers, um, growth, you know, growth partners. Um, and it's not just, you know, VCs are just one of the, the, the many funding sources that are out there. And I would, uh, especially in Dallas, where there's, there seems to be lots of great angels. There's, 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 uh, there's, some, there's some VCs, a lot, of, a lot of growth equity companies, a lot of PE companies. So there's access to capital. It's just a matter of going out and finding the right partner in the process. Now, Paul, you mentioned that um, there was a shift in your company culture around one of these these uh, these rounds. 
Um, what have you all experienced in terms of uh, pre-funding and post-funding, how the investor influences your culture, your processes, the infrastructure? Is that a positive experience or have there been challenges? Well, for, for me, um, the first time it was challenging, but this time, I, you know, we were, we were raising capital from customers and from other people. We had a fiduciary responsibility to them. And so the three, gen the other two other gentlemen that I, that I worked with, we behaved no differently, but we really worked amongst each other and tried to run the business um, as best we could and reported to each other. But the difference there was that we debated and made decisions on what we wanted to do. And then we had an advisory board where we gave options to people that we respected in the injury in the in the industry, so we we pulled on them for experience and bounced ideas off of them. But we really didn't have have to, um, you know, at the board level, yield to any type of vote that wasn't what the management team wanted to do. And I think that that's what was really important for for us in this in this venture. Leah, do you have a response to that? I've got a question for you actually as well. Well, one thing that that occurred to me. Um, you know, I think you, you, know, you have an idea, you build this business plan, you formulate this mythology behind your product and your business in your own mind, and, and there's a story, and this is how it's gonna go, and you're gonna get this money, and then these things are gonna fall into place. And what I found is that they, A, they don't fall into place, they always take longer, they're more expensive, and you find out all the things you we're wrong about, right? You make certain assumptions and you realize, you know what, that's, that's not working, that's not gonna, that's not gonna work. Um, and to me, the most important thing in terms of keeping investors happy is, you know, let, communicate, right? Never, I never had secrets from my board. I never went into a board meeting where everybody that was sitting at that table didn't already know what I was gonna talk about, because I had called them beforehand. You know, there were never surprises. It's never a good place for brainstorming. If you, if you don't t learn anything from this session, write that down. Never brainstorm in a board meeting. Because it will Somebody not turn out, out the right way now, you please. want it to. Let's... <laughs> so. so that, that's great. And I think um, you all have done this enough times now that you realize that, that going into this, you're not just um, getting something from them as far as, as capital, but there are expectations that you should have of your board and your investors as well. Can you tell us what sort of expectations you communicate to them? How should they provide infrastructure and guidance and feedback? Um, what do you look for in, in an investor and in a board? You want the politically correct answer? <laughs> well, it's gonna go out on Twitter, so. Uh, okay. so. You know, people who are supportive and who I, I like, I like having board members that have been in an entrepreneurial situation themselves. If you get somebody who's just a spreadsheet cruncher, all they've done is, you know, gone to Harvard and they worked at McKinsey and, you know, they live in this, you know, case study world that I've never been in. Um, and, you know, and, and their expectations are just really not in alignment with your reality. You know, so I don't particularly care for those types of board members. I like people who've been entrepreneurs, they've had their feet on the street, or they, they're investors that have been through enough of these experiences that they understand. You know, yes, you want people that have good connectivity, that, um, you know, understand your, your business at some level, but don't expect them to execute your business. I mean, you know, if you need a banking relationship or a phone call to somebody and they've got a connection, sure, ping them and say, hey, do you mind calling so-and-so? Um, but be realistic about how engaged you want them to be and, and what, that, what the consequences of heightened board engagement are to your ability to successfully run the operation. Gentlemen, have any thoughts to add to that? Yeah, I, I I agree 100% that you look for operational partners, people that have operated companies that, 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 that know what you're going through day in, day out, uh, but have some different experiences that they can lend that can get you in different places. One of my board members is, is pushing me to look at acquisitions, which I never thought of just because I thought grow the business, you know, one, one customer at a time, but there's, some, there's a lot of companies that have raised capital that are not doing great and they have good technology. And so it's, there's, it's, it's, it's a good time to go after folks who are just who have not been able to attract customers and, and can't get a Series B or whatever the round may be. So they're, they're, it's, they're helpful in pushing, pushing me in ways that, that I normally wouldn't think that way. Great, great. So take us through those first sort of months after you've closed the round. And um, 
explain to us, what's the timeline like as far as really getting up and running and integrated with this new partner, investor, whatever infrastructure and resources they're giving you? Is there a, is there a period of time where you're distracted from your business? You know, fundraising is very distracting as it is. You go from fundraising to closing to now integration, and I imagine you can lose a lot of time and focus on your business. I just want, I'll just volunteer this statement. I'm always fundraising. It's not like, okay, we're done. We don't have to talk to investors anymore. You know, as soon as I close one round, I'm thinking about what's the next round? What are the milestones we need to hit to get that next valuation bump? And how do we focus the organization on making those things happen? So. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. One of my, the main responsibilities I had was really to always raise capital. And what we decided to do is not, because we had a revenue, we had a product that we knew was good, and we had the ability to create some revenues along the way. So we really knew that we had hurdles that we could clear. So every round was really intended specifically to only get us to a certain round. And so we would accomplish those hurdles, and we knew that the next was coming. And because we're successful, we're able to to show that, then you know, we were able to, to not stumble, but always drive value and, and get the capital in. But I gotta tell you that I, I, you know, I've had probably six startups and three really bad ones. I've lost people's money and I've also done, done really well. I've had businesses I've built and, and got um, picked the wrong time to, for a liquidity event. And you know, with this one, you know, I'm up here with, a, with a, I guess a light of optimism because while things didn't always turn out on, this, on our venture here, the way we wanted it, but this was one of those times that it turned out better than we thought, in a different way than we thought, and um, you just got to remember your journey doesn't go in one particular way. You, there's other, different ways that you can get to where you're going, but you might have to go to a stoplight and go right or go left, and I just think it's important for the entrepreneurs to, to have that flexibility and to don't be so stuck in the um, maybe your the projections and the things that you felt like you needed to do but be intuitive about what the business really needs at that time i look at it i've, I've got a, a strategic priority list every year that i that i build and and raising money is just one of seven items so it's it's you know make the numbers take care of the customer product development roadmap uh and raise and raise capital so i you've always got to be thinking about capital needs and, and trying to and, and setting the stage for the next round but I look at it as just part of a series of things I have to do every, every day uh, in, my, in my workbook. Great, great wisdom. So I, I think people can be some of the, the strongest, greatest assets to your company. They can also be some of the greatest liabilities. Uh, you start off with a young company and maybe you've uh, built a scrappy team uh, up to a, a raise. How does that change after you, you get real money and real funding and validity behind that? Um, Tom, you mentioned hiring and recruiting are, are challenging, and I'm experiencing that my, myself. Talk to us about hiring great talent that shares your vision and can, can execute on that. <laughs> yeah, okay, sorry about that. You know, the, the person you hire today to do the job today is probably not the right person as the company, especially in a fast growing business. So I think what you have to do is look for people that they want an opportunity, they believe in what you're doing and they have the skill set to grow to the next level. So um, sometimes you outgrow people and hopefully you can put people in another position because they know where the company came from and they, they understand what you've been through and it's great to keep those people around. But sometimes the company grows at a rate uh, beyond you know, the skill set of the person that, that was with the company. And it just happens and you just have to accept it because you have to move forward and you can't let people that aren't there to slow you down or maybe even cast a bit of negativity and doubt on what you're doing. I mean, I would add that the early people that you get, you know, you're, not, you're never gonna attract the best talent when you don't have any money in a product that nobody's heard about or wants to buy, right? I mean, you're just not. So what you're gonna get are people who believe in you and who believe in what you've put on the table. And, um, and that's a great thing to have when you're starting because, you know, Bad stuff happens, there's a lot more failures than there are successes. Um, so then you get to that Series A and you've got this team of people who are tight, right? And you gotta start bringing in some new people that might displace them, right? Because now you can actually afford a marketing guy who's got you know, a little more horsepower than your friend's friend who needed a job. 
Um, and so it's tricky. You know, it's tricky to find places for those people to continue to get that, um, to make people feel valued um, and to keep that spirit that you've created with that early team. Because the new people who come in aren't gonna have the same spirit. They're not gonna have the same experience that everybody else had, you know, and so you wanna avoid that us and them uh, mindset. Oh uh, yeah, we were a part of the original team. And oh uh, yeah, that he came later, right? So you, you don't want that. So thinking of ways to really get people integrated and, and continuing that spirit and giving everybody a chance to be successful together, I think is, is important. We focus a lot on training. Um, you know, we always want to hire A players, but it's, it's, they're, they're, not, they're not always easy to find. And you, you can always take a, good, a B player and, and, and train them into an A player. There's, you, you have that ability with people, but it's, it's very hard to take a C player into a B player. And so we focus a tremendous amount on training, on product training, on um, you know, internal process training as well to make sure that our B players are always growing, growing into A players. We look very quickly at folks that we think are, that, that are C players and, and, and we, we cut bait pretty quickly. I mean, so we, we try to make decisions on people in a fairly quick pattern uh, because when you raise capital, you, you intake a lot of people and it's, you're always gonna make higher mistakes. It's just part of, part of it, so. I never fired anybody too soon. <laughs> right, yeah. And I would add that sometimes the person that needs to be let go at a certain position may be yourself. And you just need to make sure you get in your strength. You know you've been gifted on certain things. And so surround yourself with people that you can hand off the things where you're really the person that's in the way because of a lack of experience or just natural giftings or education or whatever it might be. I, I hear that a lot. My board's always like, you need to stop doing that. <laughs> That's somebody else's job. You just need to focus in on, 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 the, on the strategic priorities. So it's, they're always saying, let go of things, because you know, it, it was just me initially. Yeah. And then as it, as it, as it grew, it's, it's hard for me to give up some things. Really hard decisions. Um, it doesn't get easier, does it? What other, were there any other leadership challenges or difficult decisions that you had to make, uh, especially in those early days after funding that you didn't expect, that you didn't anticipate? What I did, when, I, when we raised our, our Series A, um, I knew that we were gonna go out and re-architect our software platform. It's a normal process. That you, every couple, every three or four years, technology changes, so you go out and you, and you re-architect, you build a better, a better mousetrap, if you will. But I knew it was gonna be bumpy for our customers. So I went out in that first quarter and I went and saw every one of our customers. I looked every one in the eye and said, in, in the eye and said here's a roadmap, here's what we're gonna to get to, but it's gonna be bumpy for the next six months. And so that was my, that was my priority, that was my concern was, you know, I, I didn't wanna lose any customers. Luckily we have them, but, uh, but that was what I focused on that. We had to shift our manufacturing platform because we were manufacturing. So my last company, uh, the one that we sold to 3M, we were manufacturing in, um, in Europe. And at the time, the euro was our friend. But um, over about a year period, the euro became not our friend anymore. And so manufacturing and buying in euros and selling in dollars was an equation that was going to work anymore. Um, and so we ended up finding a partner to work with um, who had a Maquila Dora in Mexicali, Mexico. Um, and we, you know, we had to transition from a partner who didn't really want us to leave, but who had no contractual ability to hold on to us out of Germany to get that information and that manufacturing technology and know-how, some of which we had, but there are little things that nobody ever puts in the work instructions that, you know, I won't go into detail, but that make a big difference. Um, and then the customer challenge was, everybody loves made in Germany. Well, now it's made in Mexico, right? Um, and so we needed to make sure that that didn't become a problem. You know, that there wasn't, somebody got it and said, oh, wow, this must be the one that was made in Mexico, not the one that was made in Germany. Um, and, and that took a lot of hands-on management, and we messed up. You know, we had, we had one situation where some products were stuck on a truck on the border for like five hours and it's 150 degrees in the UPS truck. And some of our, our, our product had some wax in what we delivered, right? So the customer opens it up and it's this horrible mess. And they're calling me going, what is this? Um, anyway, so um, there are, 
and I didn't anticipate that. Like when we were raising the Series A, I never thought about, oh, hey, the euro is going to go up 50%. It's going to go from you know 98 cents to a buck 40 something in a year. Who knew, right? So, but now I got to deal with that because my cost of goods doesn't work anymore. So, you know, and there was an investment that had to be made. So again, that just comes down to communication and, and management. You know, gosh, everything is actually so many things are difficult. Um, you know, it was really tricky when it came to we determined we wanted to find a strategic partner that since we were one of the fastest growing companies and we were now competing against a lot of mega companies in our space and we were beginning to take their market share and we really realized that, you know, there's a whole other level of competition that could occur in the courtroom um, and in other, in other ways. And, you know, for a year we were looking for, for the strategic partner and it was really difficult because something, it's just not done until it's done, until the check comes in, it doesn't clear. And it was really hard to, you know, ethically and honestly continue to have conversations with various strategic partners, uh, yet while you still really pursued the person that you hoped would, would come through uh, and, make, and make the offer. But it was a little more difficult than, a lot of fun, but, you know, kind of, kind of difficult to do that. Well, I just want to ask you each uh, two questions, kind of wrap it up into one, and we'll let the, uh, the audience ask some questions as well. But you guys have done this so many times now. Is there anything that you would do differently next time? And what would, you, what would your advice be to the audience, uh, folks who are looking for that next raise, that first raise perhaps? Um, what sort of wisdom might you impart to them as, as they search for capital? I, you, asked me that, you asked me that when we talked before, and I, I said that I would not do anything differently. What I, I think it's, it's worked out the way I, I hoped it would work, it would work out. Uh, as far as advice on, on, on raising money, uh, you, you have to raise money, but you want to maintain as much equity as possible. So you know, focus on the customer, build revenue, raise when you have to. Um, don't, you know, it's, the end goal is not about raising capital every time. It's about selling the business, monetizing the business. So you really want to think the think about the end goal is what happens in five ten years, uh, how much do you own, and how and, and it, has it been worth the worth the journey for you? So, so maintain your equity is what I would recommend. You know I'm with you. I don't know that I would do anything different. Um, you know I always did the best I could with whatever was coming my way. You, you know you really don't know what that's going to be, right? It's it's there's always something that you didn't anticipate. You know, um, I guess what I would say is um, there are some occasions when I wish I'd made decisions sooner. You know, I just spent a little bit too much time fretting about it and I let situations drag on longer than I should have um, with, you know, partners, with some customers, with employees. So I think, I think compared to that startup that I did in 2003 to the one that I'm doing now, I'm a lot better at seeing that and noting it in myself. And my business partner's a lot better at it too, and he's very quick to remind me, oh, hey. Um, and, and I appreciate that. Um, you know, I, I think, again, every fundraise is different because every time is different. You, know, you don't know what's going to be happening in the market. I mean, raising money in 2003 compared to two, 1999, I actually went to uh, one of those uh, Price Waterhouse conferences where they showed the money tree and they showed the little, you know, graph of money raised, 99, 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, it dropped by 97% investing in new companies. Of course, I didn't know that at the time. Um, I certainly, I felt it when nobody was returning my phone calls, but y you know, you don't know what situation you're going to end up in. Right? So you just have to deal with it the best that you can. So this really was my next time. And for the, the things I learned in the past, they, they worked out really well. But, you know, I've got to tell you that, you know, we were blessed with things that, occurred, that happened to us that were beyond our control and it just happened. But um, the most important thing I would say is raise money from people that can be strategic to your business. For us, it was physicians. It was a distributor. In Taiwan, in Taiwan, so someone that has something to gain more than just the investment, they they turn and you know we said a strategic investor, and frankly another way of saying that is is we knew that we really couldn't drive the value under a, a traditional valuation going to the financial markets, and but we knew that by breaking this up into smaller into smaller pieces, twenty five to two hundred thousand dollars, and our rule was you had to be strategic. 
to invest in our company. So I think that's the best thing that we did. And I would do it again. And I'd advise you, as you're building your business, find somebody else that wins with you. Maybe it's a vendor or whoever it might be. And they're going to be pulling for you. And they're going to see the various things that you're doing that, that can help them. So I think that's the most important thing we did. Lots and lots of wisdom here, uh, lots of experience. We've got just a few minutes for uh, audience questions, and then Fiona's going to shut me down here. So <laughs> what questions do you want to ask this veteran panel of entrepreneurs? Craig. What's the difference in business between 2000 and 2016? It's, I think it's still a lot harder to get money now than it ever was then. Um, I mean, that's my, my feeling. Um, you know, back in 2000, there was a lot of hope around internet business models that were unproven. Now we've had evidence to see what those business models look like. Um, so, you know, no one's operating on hope and faith as much, I think, as they, they used to. Um, and I think that's actually good because, you know, for entrepreneurs, you have a much better sense of what you can expect and investors the same. Um, it's so much easier to get good programming talent now, I think, than it was back in 2000. I mean, at least in my experience. Um, and programming is a whole lot easier. You know, you can, you can do, and, and rapid prototyping has made a huge difference, at least in our business, in our ability to make and iterate devices. So there's a lot of really good things, I think, that are happening now that, you know, we just didn't have access to 16 years ago. I mean, cloud computing, I mean, Amazon, I mean, we, we have 25 servers, I think. I don't even know the number anymore. We spend nothing. I mean, it's, it's, it's a fraction. And my first company, when we competed with Bloomberg, we had a... 5,000 square foot data center in Dallas. You know, we, it, was, it was fault tolerant. We had a big generator outside the building. Uh, we have none of that. We have, it's just amazing the, how much cost has been sucked out of the system by Amazon. Yeah. Look, it's always hard. And there are people in 1989 that didn't get funded and there are people today that, that don't get funded. And you know, if you're gonna go on this journey, you just have to know it is hard and you gotta beat people out that are competing with you. And, and I mean, that's, that's your job. You've got to find the right people that are in the right place, and, and they want to invest for the right reasons. And when other people tire, you need to catch your breath, and you need to keep going and persevere. And it sounds kind of simple, but it's really important that you do that. This is the first hand right here. I wouldn't say that you replace them, right? So you could, there's always, there's, there's, there's other fits in the organization. They may not be the best marketing person that you can hire now after you've raised capital, but they could be a good ops person. They could be a, a mark on person that's lower level. So it's, I, the people you've, you've, you've hired are probably good people and that, um, and they're loyal and, and they buy in the culture, they buy into the culture. So I would say, what can you do with them and that's really a management question for you versus uh, just letting go. I would absolutely agree with that. I mean, you're just going to find out that some people aren't going to be able to run as fast as they need to in the role you've got them in. I'm not a huge fan of, of firing people unless they're just egregiously making, you know, bad decisions. And, and actually, the bigger issue with me, I'm not so much concerned about decisions as I am about attitude. Because nothing will kill your startup faster than people with the wrong attitude. And those people have to go, and you can't, you really can't get them out soon enough. I don't care how talented they are. And that's always a hard decision when you hire somebody who's super smart and super talented, and they cannot get along with anyone. You know, and then it's like, well, okay, is this worth the brain damage they're causing in my organization? Is there some way I can put them in this work chart where I can get their value without their, their um, you know, their de the detrimental side effects? 
And I would agree with that. We found a, a position for people in the organization. It was attitude and belief. And, and, and I, one thing I would do earlier is, you know, the saying where there's smoke, there's fire. If you sense a bad attitude and you can sense it when you're not there, it's 10 times worse. And the moves that we made really had to do with lack of belief in what we were doing and, you know, negativity in the organization. And those people, you really need to listen to that little voice that you hear and move quicker rather than later. Is there a problem? Time for one more. Yep. One more question in the back. So the question for everybody was uh, basically, how are we, how are we seeing a change in sort of the attitudes of, of younger entrepreneurs um, entering this, this space? I don't ever remember being as hopeful as I see some of these <laughs> <laughs> folks that come into health wildcatters, and you know, I'm like, gosh, did I really have that kind of energy? I don't remember it, but I maybe I did at some point. <laughs> um, I mean, I am so inspired by the young people that I see, it's fantastic, you know? Um, and I, I, I think that, um, you know, and I, I, can't, I can't speak in sweeping statements, but I can say there were a lot of people that I went to graduate school with that we just had a mindset that was so competitive and money-driven. And I see a little bit kinder, gentler version of entrepreneurs out there now who are a little more socially conscious, they're thinking about being inclusive. You know, I mean, maybe mine was the Gordon Gecko generation of, you know, very, it was very cutthroat. Um, and I don't know that that's necessarily a good thing. You're nodding, but I mean, you know who I'm, there, there's just were people out there that, man, it was, it was rough, it was rough. So um, I'm, I'm inspired and incredibly hopeful and, and always just blown away by the young entrepreneurs that I meet and the things that they're doing. I think one of the differences, there, there's a lot available now, you know, you know, via social media and the internet and the things you can do to position your company and market are, I mean, it's fantastic. And so you really can use duct tape, bailing wire, and, you know, sit in your office and make a lot of things happen. Um, it was, it, one story that I tell is funny, so my partner and I are both in our 50s, and I heard him speaking yesterday that he was doing our social media because we didn't have anybody. And he was talking about the young marketing people who came in and had to do an intervention on him <laughs> to, to remove him from that. But it was a good move. Yeah, I would say that millennials, to me, are, they're just so smart on technology. It's so, they just jump into a position. We hired a guy last, last week, and he is already with customers, training. I mean, it's just amazing how fast he, uh, he, he jumped into it. But on the flip side, you know, if, you can tell if a millennial is not into their job. And... Uh, you know, I, had let, I had let one go about a month ago, and I sat down, and it was almost like an intervention. I said, you're not happy. And he said, well, I'm, I'm okay. I said, well, what do you really want to go do? And he said, well, I'd love to go do this. And I said, well, let's, we don't do that. We're over here. And, he, and I said, you know, it's probably time to go. And he said, yeah, I think you're right. And so he's going off, and he's chasing his dream, which is cool. But, uh, but they, they kind of know if it's a fit, and you just have to ask. He's, well, thank you all so much for your time. It's been a pleasure speaking with you all. I know there's been a lot of wisdom shared here, uh, so we appreciate your, uh, your attention, and thank you so much for being here, guests. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So I think we have another session in here in just a few minutes, so we're going to uh, go ahead and migrate outside. If you have any questions for the panelists, uh, we'll meet you out in the uh, foyer.